Nvidia's latest and greatest RTX 3090 has arrived at the office, which can only mean one thing. It's time to build the most insane gaming PC I've ever put together. Let's do this. But first, a quick word from today's video sponsor. AlphaSync's custom gaming PCs are built by eBuyer.com's in-house experts. And what's more, they've got a range of RTX 3000 series systems featuring the new 3080 and 3090 cards available to buy. Head to the first link in the description below where all the parts are sourced from the most trustworthy and innovative manufacturers. And with free next day delivery, you can get your RTX 3000 game on now. Check them out at the first link in the description below. Now, as with all my videos, I'm going to build this system step by step, run through all the parts I chose, and then do a deep dive into performance later on, testing the 3090 with over 10 of the most popular AAA titles. For now though, let's kick things off by installing the CPU, the RAM, and the SSD into our motherboard choice today. Coming in from MSI, this is one of their top-end Z490 boards, which allows us to install the i9-10900K CPU choice for today. Now, whilst there are plenty of great Threadripper options out there, as far as gaming goes, this is going to be the best choice for raw frames per second performance. Either way though, this is still a beast of a CPU for editing and it's the chip that we use to edit all the GeekerWatt videos here on the channel. I'm going to pair it with 32 gigabytes of RGB memory. Specifically, this is a Thermaltake Tough RAM kit. I've gone for one black pair, and then to be a little bit different, I've also gone for one white pair. This is going to create a really unique aesthetic which matches with the world's most insane PC case, which we're going to come on to a little bit later on. This kit is actually rated at up to 4,000 megahertz, which is just insane. You want to line the notch on the memory with the corresponding notch on your motherboard's RAM dim slot. And we're just going to slide this down, applying even pressure to both sides. You can kind of see we're going for a bit of a different black and white look for today's build. There we go, with the RAM installed, next up we're going to install the first part of today's storage solution. And for this, we're going to need a teeny, tiny little screwdriver. I'm going to remove the top slot today by taking off this heatsink cover and then taking off this tiny little retention screw. There we go. And sliding our drive into the slot. It really is pretty simple. Specifically, this is Adata's XPG S40G and it is a one terabyte NVMe boot drive with a bit of RGB that's gonna look insane. Okay then, the motherboard assembly appears to be done, which means it's time to break my back. I really wish I was joking, just hold on. Now this case is so big that it just about fits on the table. It comes in from Thermaltake and it's probably the most insane PC case that I have ever seen. Is it the most practical case ever? Probably not. Is it gonna stop all the dust from getting in? Probably not, but it looks unbelievable. And I really wanted a statement piece with these really cool kind of like wing side panels to make sure that we really do the 3090 justice. The first thing then to do, I think, is to slide the motherboard uh, into the case and get it all installed. Now, this motherboard's got a built-in IO shield, so we don't need to worry about that. We just need to make sure that under each of the nine holes through our motherboard, that we've got a corresponding standoff located here, 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 here and here, in our case. With the motherboard in, the next thing we're going to do is install the CPU cooler, which in this case is a bit more complicated than a normal typical chassis. I think if we take this kind of top section off, we should be able to slide the front radiator mount out to make our life just that little bit easier. I've got to say, these are some like hefty thumb screws. They've got some weight to them. I think that then this just comes, it does, it just comes off. We're going to install the radiator of the CPU cooler onto this bracket and then basically slide it back into the case. Cool, that actually wasn't too difficult. Took a little bit of time to figure out and the CPU cooler is now kind of sideways so that the tubes aren't too bent. What I'm going to do now before actually installing the graphics card is pop in some power cables and all the wiring and all that kind of stuff. Now this is the Thermaltake Tough Power GF1. 
It's an 850 watt unit and it's 80 plus gold certified, which means it's got the efficient juice that our RTX 3090 is most definitely going to need. In terms of the modular cables that we need to actually plug up to the power supply. First up, we've got a pair of four plus four pin CPU power connectors. So two eight pins in total. I'm also going to plug up this very large 24 pin motherboard power cable, a few SATA power harnesses to power like fan controllers and RGB hubs, and of course our SSD later. And then finally, two dual six plus two pin SATA power harnesses, giving us the three six plus two pin connectors we need for our graphics card a bit later on. All right then, with that all done, all that's really left to do is install the SSD and then of course our graphics card today. The SSD is gonna super easily slide into the sled and ignoring the cable mess for a second, this is gonna slot nicely into place and secure down with a thumb screw just like that. We need to remember to give it a bit of power and then data a little bit later. But first, it's time to install the graphics card. Now this is Nvidia's latest and greatest RTX 3090, the most powerful gaming graphics card on the market. And in Nvidia's own words, more of a Titan replacement as opposed to a top tier consumer gaming card. They say that this thing is capable of 8K gaming, but what I'm more interested to see is whether we can get a consistent 4K 100 frames per second across the board with ray tracing enabled in some of the most demanding titles on the market. Now then, in this case, we've actually got a vertical GPU mount, which is gonna look unreal. For this, you are gonna need a riser cable, which I do actually have, and we don't wanna put it too far forward, so there's enough kind of breathing room for the graphics card. And there we have it. I still need to do just a little bit of cable management, and I might pick up some sleeved power supply extension cables but aside from that, let's boot this machine up and see how it looks, but more importantly, how it performs. Hold tight and roll the montage. Okay then, now that we've put this machine together and seen just how insane it looks when it's all powered up, let's take a dive and see exactly how it performs. I've tested it with a real mix of titles today, from the latest, most demanding AAA titles to some of the more popular games from a couple of years ago, as well as thrown a few ray tracing titles into the mix. The first up today is GTA 5. GTA 5's inbuilt benchmark is my go-to test for any machine, and in this instance, at 4K high settings, with the render bars set to about halfway, you're looking at an average of 134 frames per second in GTA 5 at 4K high settings. The 90 and 99th percentile results are also just as good as you might expect, 120 and 102 to be precise, meaning this system never really dropped below 102 frames per second in GTA 5, which is just a little bit bonkers. Talking of bonkers, next up is Control. It's one of the best ray tracing titles out there. It's quite a demanding campaign, but graphically looks insane. And here at 4K very high settings, with RTX set to medium and then DLSS enabled, meaning the graphics card is kind of rendering the game out at 1440p, then using AI to upscale to 4K, you're looking 96 FPS on average with 89 and 82 frames per second for the 90th and 99th percentile results. DLSS is a great way to get the visual fidelity of 4K, uh, but the frame rates are 1440p, and the same principles apply with 1440p and 1080, 1080 and 720, etc, etc. Next up then today is Apex Legends, one of the three battle royale games that's kind of taken gaming by storm in the last kind of couple of years. Here at 4K, medium to high settings, a mixture of the two to maximise our frame rate 
and visual sharpness, and you're looking at 142 FPS on average. That's an esports level kind of average frame rate at 4K high settings, and that demonstrates just how insane this RTX 3090 is. And in fact, it's nearly 40 FPS more on average uh, than the 3080 I tested with the same CPU combo. You've also got some decent 90 and 99th percentile results, so you're guaranteed a really smooth gaming experience here. Next up then is a bit of Call of Duty's Warzone. I actually prefer it uh, to Apex Legends. I think the gun and the shooting dynamics are just that bit better. Uh, Call of Duty always kind of nail that side of the games, and I'm so happy they brought out Warzone. I, I think everybody is, to be fair. Here you're looking at an average of 117 FPS with 90 and 99th percentile results of 99 and 87 respectively. Talking of really high frame rates, I think that's a common theme for today's video. Forza Horizon 4 is next. Visually at 4K ultra settings maxed out across the board with V-Sync disabled so that our frame rate's not locked at 60, you're looking at an average of 147 FPS with a 90th and 99th percentile result of 134 and 123 respectively. Unreal numbers. Talking of unreal numbers, once again, that's kind of the, the easy segue for today's video. I next up tested Overwatch, 4K epic settings uh, with an unlimited frame rate kind of target. So once again, we're not limiting uh, that crucial FPS figure. And here you're looking at an average of 251 frames per second at 4K epic settings with 90 and 99th percentile results of 229 and 212 respectively. If you head to the RTX 3080 build in the card section now, you can compare a lot of the results today. But in short, it's over 60 FPS uh, better on the average figure, which is bonkers. It's a similar story with CSGO. Here you're looking at an average of 350 frames per second. Need I really say any more? Visually for CSGO, you know, for a game that really is a good few years old now, uh, it looks actually really quite nice. The graphics are probably the most realistic uh, that CSGO is ever going to get. Uh, and the game looks great. No stuttering, no lag, no screen tearing. And a stupidly high 350 frames per second. Next up today then is Battlefield 5. The first... Well, the second ray tracing title actually uh, and here with dlss enabled once again just like in control rtx turned on uh, and dx12 of course enabled at 4k high settings you're looking 98 fps on average with a 90 and 99th percentile result of 86 and 76. I stand by my opinion that to the day, I think Battlefield 5 is one of the best ray tracing demos out there, at least visually. Because you've got so many explosions, a load of standing water, it really is a spectacle when you throw a grenade and see those ray traced beams of light explode from the ground. And of course, if you wanted to turn RTX off or drop down to 1440p, you could easily get 140, 150 plus frames per second. Next up then today is Doom Eternal. It's not a ray tracing title and it is a few years old at this point, but it is a really, really good test of rasterization. It's a game that visually, considering it doesn't actually have ray tracing, looks unbelievable. It's kind of really realistic in a fantasy, creepy, quite scary way. Uh, and here you're looking at an average of 163 FPS uh, with the 4K Ultra Nightmare preset. Yes, if you haven't played that game, uh, that is the preset name. And of course, V-Sync disabled uh, with a 90 and 99th percentile result of 155 and 126 respectively. Before I jump into the final game today, Fortnite, which I've tested with a few different settings variations, I want to give a big shout out to MSI, who kindly sent over this 4K curved gaming monitor so I could test the 3090 in all of its glory. And coupled with their new GK50 Elite, uh, which is the successor to the GK50, my favourite low profile key keyboard, it made a great gaming experience and I'll link uh, my recommended monitor and peripherals in the description as always. Finally then, it is Fortnite time. I first tested it with 4K high settings, uh, DLSS enabled, set to performance mode for even more frame rate and RTX disabled. 
Here, the game looked visually incredible, and at 197 frames per second, at 4K high settings, I mean, I cannot emphasize how insane these numbers are. You're looking at 197 FPS, uh, with 90 and 99th percentile results of 152 and 128, respectively. Crank ray tracing on, keep DLSS at performance. We've gone for kind of ray tracing on the medium mode, and you're looking at an average of 60 FPS at 4K, with the 90 and 99th percentile centiles not really dropping much below this figure. Visually, I prefer the look of the ray tracing title, but if you're a keen esports gamer, you're competing in tournaments, or you know, you're know you desperate for that W, uh, then the 197 FPS on average, that's probably the better option for you. With that being said though, that pretty much wraps it up, not only for the benchmarks today, but for the whole video. If you enjoyed it, make sure to give it a big old like rating, get subscribed for more from me. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.